speaker today is uh, Doug Zemeckis, and Doug is uh, in our department, the Ag and Natural Resources. He's our marine extension agent, and he has multiple counties, Ocean, Atlantic, and Monmouth. And we're always bugging Doug, where's the best place to fish? Um, so what we thought we would do is, in line with the Home Setting Academy uh, theme, um, look at recreational fishing as a source of sustenance. So we're very lucky to have Doug not out on a ship or out somewhere out in the boat. Um, we've tried to get him uh, other times and he's out in the boat. I'll get the message on his email. I'm out in the boat. So consider yourself lucky. He's an expert and we're going to work the questioning a little bit different. Doug's actually going to take a break and answer some questions and then he'll go on with his presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Doug. Great. Thanks, Bill and Kate. Uh, just confirmation, you can see my slides, my second we, screen? We've got you. Yes. All right. Fantastic. Cool. Well, thanks for the introduction, Bill. Thank you both for the invitation and having uh, for me to contribute to Homesteading Academy here, looking at the lineup you've covered and are going to cover. Uh, it's great to infuse some uh, marine realms into the Homesteading Academy. As Bill put it, looking at recreational fishing as an opportunity for sustenance or food harvesting. Uh, it's not just about recreation. A lot of people who are already involved with fishing recreationally or who might get involved uh, are interested in harvesting their catch for, for uh, consumption. So uh, I'm going to dive in here today, provide an overview of New Jersey's marine recreational fisheries. Uh, provide a lot of the different resources that are out there about the different opportunities to fish recreationally. As Bill noted, we'll pause about halfway through for some questions. And then the second half of my talk, I'll give some examples and a little bit of biology of summer flounder, striped bass, and hard clams as some example species that are common to fish for recreationally and to teach a little bit more about the biology and management of those concurrently. So uh, New Jersey is obviously known as the Garden State, but we have over 120, almost 140 miles of coastline along the Atlantic coast. And then if you look at the Raritan Bay, Delaware Bay, the different estuaries, Great Bay, Barnegat Bay, we have hundreds of miles of coastline, uh, which provide uh, many, many opportunities for marine recreation and commercial, whether it be fishing or aquaculture, but then also uh, recreational fisheries from the shorelines all the way out to over 100 miles from shore, depending upon if you're fishing for summer flounder or blue crabs or offshore for tuna and swordfish. We have uh, very diverse and productive uh, recreational and commercial fisheries here in New Jersey. Uh, I'm gonna show a couple uh, slides here from the NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service. As you may or may not be aware, NOAA has two primary branches, the National Weather Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service. As the name entails, the fishery service plays a large role in science and management, management of our marine fisheries, including developing reports on the different industries. Uh, so every couple of years, they come out with a report on the fisheries economics of the United States. Uh, they break it down by na national, regional, state. Uh, and shown here are some data for the New Jersey's recreational fisheries. The most recent data year from which full uh, data are available is 2018. Uh, and you look at it for New Jersey, the total state economic impacts, these are in million, uh, thousands of dollars. So it's a $1.2 billion industry here in the state of New Jersey, uh, supporting over 14,000 jobs in the different sectors. Uh, many of these metrics in terms of jobs, value, or catch, I'll show coming up, we're in the top 10, if not the top five uh, listing of states in the U.S., behind other states you more commonly think about of recreational fishing like California, Florida, Alaska. We're right up there in Massachusetts. We're right up there in many of these metrics. Uh, the recreational fishery is pretty diverse. There's different modes by which you can go recreational fishing. Um, there's party or head boats where you pay per person in your party or per head to take you out fishing. These could be a half day trip for four or five hours, three quarter day for seven or eight, or some trips are overnight, even 24 or 36 hours. Uh, depends on if you're fishing near shore or further offshore. Uh, so you get a less private experience, but uh, it's uh, you may or may not have to reserve. You can go day of uh, out on a party boat. Uh, there's charter boats. Most of them are six pack boats, uh, typically reserved in advance, groups of six, sometimes up to 12. Uh, you can reserve one spot more uh, recently years or traditionally at the charter of the whole boat, uh, a more private experience on a typically smaller boat. Uh, and actually 
in terms of the number of vessels, of course, or the amount of catch, uh, the private boat fishery, whether you own a boat, a friend owns a boat, uh, the private boat sector is uh, a major uh, component of the recreational fishery. And here in New Jersey, uh, shore-based anglers, whether you're surf fishing off the beach, uh, off a pier, or off a marina, um, land-based. Uh, and this joke here, but this value added includes also uh, tackle expenditures, fuel, uh, bait, ice uh, that gets infused into the local economy. Uh, so recreational fishing is also really important to coastal tourism. Uh, taking a look at the anglers in our marine recreational fishery uh, from 2009 to 2018, uh, there's been a bit of a downward trend, over a million now down to about 750,000 uh, individuals participating in marine recreational fishing. Interestingly, a lot of them, maybe about 30 to 50 percent, come from out of state or non-coastal counties. So it plays an important role also in our coastal tourism. A lot of people come to the Jersey Shore uh, interested and expecting to either have the opportunity to fish for themselves or wanting to consume local seafood. So uh, that's an important element of, of this industry as well. Uh, and looking at recreational fishing effort by mode, these are the total, total number of trips in thousands that these anglers are taking. So, you know, 17, 18 million trips down to about 12 million trips in 2018. Uh, and a, almost half, almost or more than half of these are actually shore-based anglers fishing off the shore or piers as they might exist throughout the state. Uh, and then you see the for hire. So that's the party charter boat industry. And you have the private boat sector, which is, as I noted, a major contributor in terms of the number of trips, but also the overall catch rates. Uh, so this large table here, we can dive in if people are interested in any particular species, but what this is showing is the most commonly caught species, not necessarily the most valuable or often the most valuable, but most common in terms of numbers that are harvested and released. So by numbers, the most common are summer flounder, bluefish, sea bass, striped bass, and blackfish or totog. Uh, and you get an idea like summer flounder is by far the most uh, popular in terms of the numbers landed and thrown back and the number of anglers targeting them. For example, if you look at 2018, about uh, 1 million fish were actually harvested and brought home by recreational anglers, but over 10, uh, over 10 million fish are caught and released. Uh, you see that as pretty common with striped bass included, even bluefish, sea bass. Uh, due to management measures, uh, minimum sizes, closed seasons, possession limits, a lot of fish are actually caught and released in recreational fisheries. And it could also be the conservation ethics amongst the anglers who might prefer catch and release. Uh, but a large segment of the industry, and when available within the regulations, uh, there's interest in not only catch and release, but harvesting for consumption, uh, relevant here to the homesteading academy as opportunities for uh, harvesting your own seafood here through our recreational fisheries. In fact, you know, I, I spend my time all really in the marine realm, fisheries and aquaculture, marine resource issues, but obviously Homesteading Academy and our Department of Ag and Natural Resources uh, drawing some pal parallels. Um, marine recreational fishing could be likened in some ways to uh, agritourism. To show before, a lot of folks come to the coast uh, to fish or to, you know, arguably to consume local seafood. And it's also a form in a way of pick or catch your own as well. Uh, and at first glance, most people think of recreational fishing as, you know, merely for recreation. Uh, it's fun, uh, even though, you know, it might cost a fair amount of money or you got to get up early in the morning traditionally. Uh, could be a bit painful early starts, but, um, you know, these researchers in 2017 published a paper looking at the nexus of fun and recreation that Recreational fishing is also about food, and you know that bears out in uh, a lot of the response to uh, recreational anglers to management. Um, you know, more liberal measures where you can have the opportunity to catch fish, as opposed to if they're more restrictive possession limits. Uh, in many cases, you know, lead, could lead to more fishing effort, um, showing that you know there's motivation there. That you know, we see myself here in a charter. You know, uh, bringing home black sea bass and a striped bass are a large part of the uh, motives uh, in recreational fishing. And, you know, here we are today, uh, you know, November 8, uh, excuse me, October 18th, 
Uh, October is actually National Seafood Month, so uh, quite timely uh, as well here for the uh, opportunity to speak to you this month. Uh, and you can take a look at the NOAA National Marine Fishery Service. They have something uh, weekly or maybe even every day broadcasted out in recognition of National Seafood Month. And we here at Rutgers Cooperative Extension, we also have a program in recognition of National, uh, National Seafood Month. Myself and three educators from our Family and Community Health Sciences Department, uh, we're teaming up for the third year, consecutive year, for our program, What's the Catch? New Jersey Seafood and Healthy Living. Registration still open. This program is next Wednesday night, October 26th, 6 to 7.30 p.m. You can join in person at Ocean City Library, Ocean City, New Jersey, Cape May County, or you can uh, log in, uh, participate via Zoom webinar uh, like you're doing here today, live or recording. Uh, and this uh, program, we're going to be educating folks on the sustainable local seafood production that we have here in New Jersey from our commercial and recreational fishery, fisheries as well as our shellfish aquaculture. Then the FCHS team will be uh, educating participants on the health and nutrition benefits of consuming seafood. Uh, and there's also a complimentary uh, fact sheet that we have available here through Extension. Uh, Karen Ensley, Eating Fish is Healthy, as an, also a great resource if you can't participate in that program. And in general, whether you're harvesting it recreationally or if you are purchasing seafood, uh, some great resources are available at federal and state levels. If you wanna learn more about the sustainability of our fisheries, making responsible seafood choices based upon environmental sustainability and health uh, criteria, uh, my top recommendation is the NOAA Fish Watch program. Uh, it's a very useful tool, you can go uh, fishwatch.gov, Got gov. You go in here, you type in just about any species that's farmed or wild caught in the U.S., uh, and then you get to a page. So, for example, here's black sea bass. Their overall recommendation is a smart seafood choice because it's sustainably and managed, responsibly harvested within U.S. regulations. These are just some of the take-homes. You can get an idea of the population status, habitat impacts from the way it's harvested, what the fishing mortality rate's like, if there are any bycatch issues bycatch issues. Uh, you scroll down, there's even uh, recipe recommendations. So uh, really great tool uh, available from NOAA National Marine Fishery Service. Also, here's just an example I included for yellowfin tuna. Uh, they have the same uh, recommendation based upon the population level, management measures that are in place here in the U.S. Uh, and uh, another great example that is available here of recreational fisheries, uh, but also our commercial fisheries longliners uh, target uh, yellowfin tuna for commercial production. So a lot of folks generally ask, you know, uh, a lot of misperceptions out there about this, the condition and health of our fisheries and the resources. Uh, we Our Federal Fisheries Management Act, the Magnus and Stevens Fishery Management and Conservation Act, since the mid-1970s, um, that federal fisheries management policy and a lot of fishery management being in place here in New Jersey since the early to mid-90s, has been arguably quite successful in meeting biological objectives. We still have a lot of work to do in the social and economic realms, but biologically, uh, it's been doing quite well. You can uh, take a look at the status of the stocks at the national level, but here in New Jersey, they break, we're in the mid-Atlantic region. We only have two stocks that are considered overfished, uh, bluefish uh, and Atlantic mackerel, which was just recently added. Uh, otherwise else, you know, we have really overall biomass wise, quite healthy stocks. New England uh, has a lot of problems uh, in, in managing overfishing. Some of those stocks we used to have down here, like winter flounder, Atlantic cod, uh, ocean warming has not been positive for those species at the southern extent of their range. Uh, but as you can note, those in the mid-Atlantic, overall, we have uh, quite healthy populations uh, integrated uh, overall. Uh, another uh, useful tool, if you're heading out recreational fishing, uh, NJDEP has this Fish Smart, Eat Smart program. Uh, you can take a look on there. They have uh, examples, uh, advisories uh, for local water bodies, uh, marine and fresh water. Uh, some, exa some examples, some locations up by Newark, Hoboken, uh, some uh, water quality issues, locations where you should not be eating blue crabs. Uh, there are some recommendations on limiting striped bass, I believe, uh, consumption if they're harvested at a different locations. Uh, so there's some federal and state level uh, resources in terms of 
uh, environmental and health conscious uh, seafood consumption and harvesting. So I'm going to dive in a little bit now to talk a bit about the where and when some resources from DEP uh, before breaking in a few minutes for questions. Uh, this is, talk is also well-timed. DEP, uh, not just in fish and wildlife, but in other, other divisions, have been putting out updated web pages. And their marine uh, web pages for fisheries and aquaculture have been uh, considerably improved and are now uh, really useful resources. So here's the homepage for saltwater recreational fishing here in New Jersey. Uh, and first things first is to evaluate whether or not you need uh, to be in the saltwater registry or have a license or permit uh, before you go marine and recreational fishing. So it's not like freshwater fisheries, uh, which I don't have much expertise on, where, you know, just I believe just about all instances, you're going to need a license depending upon your age. Um, but recreationally marine here in New Jersey, if you're over age 16 uh, and you are fishing off the shore or a private boat, you need to register for free under the New Jersey Saltwater Registry Program. No permit, uh, but you need to be in the registry. Helps with data collection, monitoring of the fishery, identifying who's fishing and how, how often they're going, data that feeds into the science and management. If you're fishing on a party or charter boat, uh, you don't need to be in the registry, but private boat, shore-based, you do. And that's when you're fishing for fin fish. If you're fishing for shellfish, you know, primarily hard clams, maybe a little bit of recreational harvest at times for oysters or, or blue mussels, or in some instances when you're fishing for crabs, if you're using more than a, a hand line or a larger a trap, uh, you need to have a license from the shell fisheries. So uh, this web page here uh, and this information can help you get geared up, uh, legally speaking, um, for the registry or the license, respectively. Uh, this nice, useful uh, web page, too, helps you access this with, uh, through Fish and Wildlife DEP. Uh, and you can, you can purchase these items as, you know, relevant for the licenses right on your uh, computer, tablet, or smartphone uh, and get, it, get confirmation emails. So... As noted, an ex uh, example here, this table on the right, attention anglers. Uh, this is published every year by DEP to help uh, folks who go on recreational fishing to be in tune with uh, the management measures for the most common species. Uh, this is also included in their annual marine digest. Uh, there's one for recreational fishing, freshwater, as well as also uh, hunting. Um, so these are good resources that come out annually from DEP. Uh, but on attention anglers, you get an idea of hard clams, tatog, striped bass, summer winter flounder, and more listed here. Uh, the three major levers that managers pull and adjust for recreational fishing are examples for the minimum sizes. Ideally, uh, minimum sizes are larger than the size at which an animal becomes sexually mature. So that way they hopefully have the opportunity to reproduce and replace themselves in the population before you harvest them. There's typically a limit, uh, a responsible, sustainable limit, 150 clams, three summer flounder as an example, uh, that you can keep on a daily basis. Uh, and then you also get seasons. Uh, for example, summer flounder this year was open May 2nd, September 27th. So uh, you just missed it by a few weeks, even though there's still some around in our coastal waters. Uh, the season wraps up lately at the end of September. So these are good resources uh, to keep uh Keep in mind when you're gearing up or when you're out fishing, uh, keep this on your boat, keep it in your tackle bag uh, so, you, so you make sure you're in compliance with uh, the management measures. This, uh, on that note too, uh, DEP just put out for the first time this Gantt chart, which is really helpful. You can see, you can see how all these overlap. Uh, for example, if you go out fishing in October, say you watch this webinar, you're thinking about going in November, you wanna know what's open. Uh, so you have black sea bass, you're allowed 15 fish, um, bluefish is open, scupper porgies, striped bass is open year round in state waters. Um, but as we noted, summer flounder just closed. Uh, but there's great fishing opportunity coming up here in the fall um, in terms of what's open and some of the best fishing for um, black sea bass around our local and offshore wrecks and reefs. Uh, scup and porgies are great catches in the fall. And as I'll talk later, striped bass is big, uh, very common this time of year as well. If so, if you're if you're very new to recreational fishing or have some experience, if you're very new, a great starting point is, you know, going on a party charter boat. Uh, a lot of us, myself included, a lot of folks who even work on commercial fishing boats, 
Uh, they've gotten their starts on party and charter boats. It's a good place to learn, get exposed, see what other anglers are doing, see what the captains and mates recommend, fish different boats, different fisheries, get an idea of what you're interested in. So that's a great starting point. You can go to this, this DEP website, uh, the homepage I showed earlier here, get an idea of where the party and charter boats are, whether it be down in Cape May, there's some in Ocean City, only one left in Barnegat Light. Uh, Belmar, Point Pleasant, Atlantic Highlands has a lot of party and charter boats. Uh, that's a great way to get started. If you're starting on your own private boat or off the shore, a good way to get geared up and, and uh, get an idea of what's going on is to go to your local tackle shop to purchase your gear, uh, seek out a local tackle shop for some recommendations on how to fish, where to fish. Uh, so this saltwater fishing explorer tool that outlines some of the major offshore canyons, the artificial reefs in green closer to shore, other major fishing spots. But in blue, if you were to zoom in, you can click, for example, here in Brigantine, Atlantic County, you can click on the surf, uh, Brigantine Island Surf North, the jetties of Atlantic City, and that's so you can inlet. Uh, gives you a little bit of information on uh, joining the registry, maybe some local issues. And some of these other blue spots are some tackle, tackle shops. So that can help you find a local tackle shop, uh, which are great places for uh, resources and information to help you help you get started. So that's what I have for the first half, Kate. I'm happy to pause now and see if they have any, or Bill, and see if they have any questions. I'll, I'll start you off, I guess, as we wait. Um, with the, uh, you know, they talk about the, the water temperature increasing in the ocean. What kind of um, changes are we seeing, like, in the species or the migration patterns on the Jersey Shore? Yeah, great question, Bill. I have something coming up related to summer flounder, but I'll, I'll, I'll set the, the, the course here. Um, with ocean warming related to climate change, uh, we've seen many of our species shift their distribution uh, further east, so further offshore, further north, in many instances also out to deeper water. Um, this is uh, in response a lot in times to uh, warming temperatures, but also there's been some shifts in predator prey, so their prey might have shifted. Some populations have declined their numbers, some have increased. So as that happens too, they might contract or expand into different habitats. Um, so the species have been shifting uh, mostly to the north and east, but in different directions. Overall, the colder water species like winter flounder, cod, uh, whiting, things we used to catch much more commonly decades ago, are much less abundant. And we're seeing more warm water species come in, particularly South Jersey, things like cobia, sheep's head, mahi-mahi. So uh, we have white, quite diverse fisheries and, and they're changing over time. Um, a lot of it's also to our oceanography. We have warm and cold currents that come off our coast and we have some of the most diverse fisheries and some of the widest temperature ranges anywhere in the world as a result. Along those same lines as Bill's question, I um, brought up a question with your catch and release table that you showed early on. I was wondering if those changes in the numbers um, were related at all to changes in the catch limits, if you'd noticed any trends and um, changes to what you're actually permitted to harvest over over these years. Yeah, good question, Kate. As, as I mentioned, there's three levers that fishery managers pull for re managing recreational fisheries, the length of the season, how many you can keep and what the minimum size is. So uh, summer flounder, as an example, you know, this ends at 2018. These did, these reports only come out every couple of years, but this year it was three fish, two between 17 and 18, one above 18 inches. So that results in a, in the past, you were, you were allowed like eight fish at like 14 or 15 inches, maybe even in the beginning of this, uh, maybe 16 back in 2009. Um, so the management measures have changed, which has also resulted in a lot of discarding of uh, undersized fish or if we have your, above your possession limit. And, and the challenge there is in the summer flounder fishery, 15%, excuse me, 10% are estimated to die after catch and release. So that gets calculated up in the total catch. Um, but it's a balance between having the season open for hopefully the whole summer and then some for the local economy uh, versus providing opportunity to harvest. If the management measure is more liberal, the season would be much shorter as an example. So it's a tough balance to strike. Absolutely. I don't see any questions in the chat. All right. Well, I can th I've got another question too that comes up to me every once in a while, Doug. If yeah. you're new to fishing 
and you talk about all different species and stuff like that. Do you have any resource you recommend for people for fish ID? Because I know some people go, I have no idea what I have on the end of my line. <laughs> Good question, Bill. Something that's you know useful for the uh, average angler. So uh, I was going to include that here. Maybe I should have based upon your question. But uh, this attention angler shows you the most common. But it also, there's things listed here that don't have photos. So the marine digest so uh it's in most tackle shops we have it here at our ocean county extension office it's on online here uh they have a species id in there for like the most common 40 species uh species so there's a photo uh the species and then you can match it up to here for what the management measures are so that that's the easiest go-to if somebody wants to get more advanced there's uh peterson guides that are the best field guides for this area that'll uh, really help you ID anything that you catch. But for most anglers, uh, there's a species ID in the Marine Digest, and I think on the new DEP webpage that'll uh, help you. No, that's helpful because I've heard people say, I don't know if I'm violating, you know, I have something I shouldn't have. Or That's a big, uh, a big issue. And it, um, it is one that comes to mind here in New Jersey. We have several spark shark species that are protected or prohibited. You're not even allowed to target them. Uh, if you were to find out that you had one, for example, uh, you know, um, sand tiger sharks as an example, uh, which is, you know, they're prohibited. You're not allowed to harvest or target them, but they're common, particularly amongst shore-based anglers. So as soon as you find out you have one, you're supposed to remove the hook without taking it out of the water and release it. But shark ID is very challenging, even for a biologist. Uh, and uh, linked from this page, uh, there's a NOAA resource that has about the 20, 30 most common mid-Atlantic shark species that'll help you ID them. So definitely if anybody here is going shark fishing, you should really study up on that. Uh, enforcement was writing summonses for people um, not following the regulations when targeting and catching prohibited shark species the last few years. Sounds like a great idea to get out on one of those party boats or, uh, you know, with another experienced fisher um, and before you try to go out on your own. Yes. And it, uh, it is, I, I hear it is quite accurate. I've looked at it a few times. I didn't find any errors, but the state is, you know, a very useful resource here for the management measures. There's another app, a phone app. I think it's called Fish Rules, Fish Rules. Uh, and it, you can go look for, you know, any U.S. state and any species, and it's pretty well up to date. Like I've tested it on some of our, our management measures and it's been accurate. Uh, so there's also a phone app, I think it's Fish Rules, so folks can have that uh, helpful too if you fish between different states, which is actually not too uncommon. People in Delaware Bay will be on the Jersey or Delaware side. People up in Raritan Bay will be in New York and Jersey waters on the same day. And you, you gotta make sure you're, you're following the state's measures that you're currently sitting in. All right. Well, I don't see any questions in the chat, so maybe we can move forward unless Anne had a question. You've got a wealth of knowledge here uh, as our speaker, so take advantage of it. I see her unmuted, but I don't know if she has anything. Yeah, Anne, we're not able to hear you if you're trying to ask a question. Um, okay. I think we can move forward. All right, should I continue? Go for it. All right, cool. <laughs> Hopefully folks found that to be an interesting primer there, different components of our recreational fishery, where to find different information based upon your per what might be needed in terms of registry or permit, uh, where to go fishing, the different modes, part of your charter for, the, for hire, shore-based, uh, private boat, uh, we have uh, obviously a lot of different opportunities. The Gantt chart showed you what's open different times of the year. Uh, so uh, this fall is a great opportunity for a lot of different fisheries. Although I'm now going to dive a bit more to provide into some of the more common summer flounder, striped bass, uh, but then also hard clams. So some different types of recreational fishing opportunities. So before summer flounder closed uh, a couple weeks ago at the end of September, but uh, it is our most common in terms of the number of anglers. And probably, we don't have great economics data, but it's probably most important economically for our recreational fisheries as well. So the summer flounder resource, although 
you know, Rutgers extension. We're focusing on New Jersey. Uh, many of the folks this program is hosted out of Burlington County, but we have our coastal counties. Uh, the summer flounder population is actually managed from North Carolina to Maine. Uh, and there's different migratory patterns, there's different groups. Uh, so when talking about New Jersey, you actually got to consider the whole Northeast and the commercial and recreational fisheries. Management was just changed. We see the commercial landings in the blue bars, the recreational landings in the green, and then the discarded fish that die afterwards commercially and recreationally. Get an idea of the fishery since 1982. Uh, on, on the recreational front, about 45, 50% of the catch the last few years has been recreational. So a lot of people, you know, even though there's only one individual, you might not catch many summer flounder. You might go twice a year and only hook 10 maybe. Um, but coastwide, we have 750,000 or more anglers in New Jersey, uh, and it adds up. Um, and that's what these data reflect, that um, it's just under or near just as much as harvested commercially coastwide. So uh, you might not do a big, uh, you know, damage with one rod and reel, but when uh, the whole industry does add up over time. Uh, so we'll walk you through this here, uh, if you're uh, without getting too technical, but stock assessments are what are used to estimate how many fish are in the ocean, which is, is inherently very difficult. Uh, obviously, fish are underwater and they move. Shellfish don't even don't really move. Um, but just being underwater, let alone moving, makes it very hard to count how many fin fish or shellfish in the ocean. It's not like counting trees in a forest. Uh, so population models use fishery catch data or understanding of their biology uh, and also different surveys done by federal, state agencies or universities. Uh, and this is a model of how many summer flounder in the Northeast. Um, the solid black line is the spawning stock biomass. That's how the weight of reproductively capable summer flounder from North Carolina to Maine. Uh, the management plan came into play like 1993, 1994, and you see the population responded quite positively to that and other changes. It was above the, the maximum sustainable yield threshold. So the stock was not, and even half that rate, the stock's not considered overfished, but there's been a decline in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, a little bit of an uptick around 2019. Um, but overall, there's higher biomass than there was in the 90s. Uh, arguably, that management plan has, you know, met a lot of its biological goals. We're more summer flounder now than it was in the 80s and 90s based upon the stock assessment. The bars in the back are recruitment. R, it's the measure of age zero, baby, young of the year, summer flounder. So New Jersey, Delaware, um, New York, all these states do surveys to estimate how many baby larval summer flounder that are out there. You want an idea of not just how many adults, but how many babies are coming behind for sustainable fisheries. Just like if you're, uh, you know, you know, planting, uh, you know, crops that take multiple years to grow like hard clams, you want to know all the different types of ages you have out there. So also the science monitors the adults and also the babies. The summer flounder life cycle is quite interesting. Uh, this time of year, October, November, they start leaving our coastal waters and our estuaries, and they migrate offshore. This red envelope is about their overwintering habitat and approximately where they reproduce during the colder months. The eggs and larvae that have released during favorable conditions with the ocean currents and winds, they get transported on the shore and those have the greatest survival. The eggs will hatch into larvae after a few weeks, uh, the larvae enter our estuaries where they spend the first year of their life. Uh, so summer flounder are subjected to uh, habitat conditions offshore, inshore, whether it be uh, bottom, uh, the substrate or the seagrass habitat, are really important for the survival of the young of the year summer flounder. When they reach about age one at the, at the end of the fall, beginning of the fall, they'll then migrate offshore to start reproducing at the age of one even. Uh, and they enter this inshore offshore migration. Recreationally, the fisheries open sometime in May to sometime in September. So they're caught and targeted when they're closer to shore, the near shore waters or our estuaries during the warmer months is when the recreational fishery occurs. In contrast, most of the commercial fishing happens in this area during the winter. So Bill, like you asked before about uh, shifts in distribution, 
NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service, they've been doing surveys, bottom trawl surveys, from Cape Hatteras to Canadian waters since the mid to late 1960s. This animation is going to show the numbers that they caught per location, red being a lot, blue being none, each year during the fall, which is October. Gives you an idea of the distribution up till 2015. We had and we still have good numbers of summer flounder off our coast through much of this period. There were not many summer flounder off Rhode Island and Massachusetts, um, but related to warming, shifts in their prey, expansion of the population, getting a lot more summer flounder off Long Island, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, even out onto George's Bank the last few years. To the extent some of our commercial fishing boats from New Jersey or Virginia, North Carolina, they're fishing all the way up here some years for summer flounder. Um, but a lot of the commercial fishing happens here off New Jersey. Uh, and then our recreational fishery happens near shore for summer flounder. That's when the opportunity is to harvest your own summer flounder. But this shift in the resources made it very complicated to manage on a state by state basis. Uh, some of these northern states now want more quota because they have more summer flounder now than they do in the past. So that was a good question before, Bill. Um, very uh, uh, dynamic environment, shifting distribution of the resources, challenge for management. We at Rutgers have this ocean adapt tool that you can check out. You can type in all kinds of different species in there and see how their distribution has shifted over the last several decades as well. So as I showed before, about 45% or so of the, the catch uh, recreationally uh, of summer flounder coastwide is recreational, the balance being commercial. Uh, and looking at this table for New Jersey, uh, we have a large role and large allocation of the summer flounder quota. Uh, 2018, 19, 20, it's 40 something, 57% of the catch came from New Jersey in 2020. Take a, take a look at the overall harvest in millions of fish or pounds recreationally in all the Northeast. Apply those percentages. In 2019, we had almost 3.6 million pounds of summer flounder harvested recreationally. So if you're thinking about food production from recreational fishing, that's a lot of food production and a lot of opportunity, even though the limit's only three per person per day. Um, on a state level, that's a lot of grams of protein and that's a lot of food being picked or caught for your own and your family consumption. Uh, so a, a great opportunity and a lot of food production here in New Jersey just from uh, summer flounder fishing alone. So that's all I was gonna show tonight. Happy to talk more about summer flounder if folks want in the future. Um, but as a note at the season just, just ended at the end of September. Um, for most of the state, it's three fish, excuse me, uh, two fish at 17 inches to 18. That's called that a slot limit. The idea is to try to reduce the pressure on the large adult females, uh, and then you're allowed one fish above 18 inches. Uh, and there's some different management measures if you're in Island Beach State Park or down in Delaware Bay uh, to help provide some other fishing opportunities. But uh, you can take a look at DEP's webpage for the latest on the, on the management measures for summer flounder. We don't know them yet for next year. They won't come out until you know sometime in the winter or even early spring uh, for next year. Other species I want to give a, a you know a crash course, a 10,000 foot view over uh, the very popular striped bass. Um, so striped bass, the what's known as the Atlantic migratory stock, uh, they range from uh, North Carolina all the way up to Maine, uh, and they're quite mobile. Um, some of the uh, actually, I'll use this one for that. So uh, there's three major spawning areas for striped bass. Uh, the major one in the last decade or more has been the Chesapeake Bay. The Delaware Bay and Delaware River historically was much more productive than it has been in the last decade or two um, for spawning of striped bass. Uh, Hudson River is the number two, uh, arguably behind the Chesapeake. So striped bass are what are known as anadromous. The adults, they'll spend their life out in the estuaries or out at sea, and they'll return to these estuaries to spawn uh, during the spring. So these large migratory pathways, so say a striped bass in the Delaware River, will have to finish spawning, come out in the spring. Um, some, some of them are residents and they'll actually stay locally, um, but the, by the majority are migratory. They might head up uh, during the summer to southern New England, Massachusetts, all the way to Maine, and then we're chasing their prey and cooler, what are relatively cooler temperatures, and they migrate back down during the fall. 
uh, and winter uh, and get ready to spawn again in the spring. So this migratory cycle, um, the best striped bass fishing off New Jersey tends to be in the spring, uh, April, May, June, and now during the fall when they come back, October, November, and even December. Some years you'll catch them well even in January. So that, uh, that provides the greatest recreational fishing opportunity uh, here in New Jersey spring and fall. As I noted, there are some residents. So if you, if you get in tune with your local water bodies and some of the different creeks and rivers, um, there are some striped bass around even during the warmest months. Uh, they're a bit harder to catch, but spring and fall, the prime times. We don't have a commercial fishery in New Jersey. It's all recreational. Uh, and the commercial quota actually goes back to the recreational sector here in New Jersey. So very important recreational species. Uh, the minimum size in current times, you're allowed one fish between 28 and 38 inches. What this is showing is an age length key. So uh, these diamonds are the average. So a 28 eight inch fish on average is about eight years old. Uh, so they take longer to reach the minimum size. Uh, 38 inch fish on average is about you know 13 years or so. Um, so pretty large adult fish, um, relatively old. I mean, uh, you need to be about eight years old to grow to 28 inches. Um, they're highly fecund or the fecundity. They produce a lot of eggs. Uh, the larger females do produce more eggs. 40 inch females, you know, maybe about 2 million eggs. So uh, they're often called boffs, big old fat fecund female fish. Um, so larger females produce more eggs that are larger have greater hatching success and greater survival. So a variety of management measures, including striped bass, where you can't keep them above 38 inches. The idea is to let the large females reproduce as many times as possible to get that egg production out there, which is thought to help uh, with the recruitment and the long-term sustainability. So that way, recreational anglers here in New Jersey can enjoy for catch and release and harvest striped bass for many years to come. There was a moratorium on striped bass in the 70s, 80s, uh, this is um, showing a similar type of information, just different tailored to striped bass, as I showed before for um, summer flounder. But the blue mountain in the back corresponds to the left axis. So that's the spawning stock biomass, the weight of females in the population. Uh, again, the moratorium and some more strict management measures. Uh, well, moratorium, you can't get much more strict than that. Um, prohibited harvest, but the population responded well in the late 80s, 90s, uh, was above the threshold. Uh, the stock wasn't considered overfished, but if you've been following the measures, you were allowed to keep two fish uh, for several years. Now you only allow one fish. The population, depending upon where your eye grabs around maybe 2002 or three even, has been trending downward. Uh, the last population assessment went through 2017 or 18, still waiting for an update, but um, new management measures were put in place the last few years to try to correct this, right this trend, and try to rebuild the striped bass population, get it above these thresholds. Um, that's why there's been some more strict management measures. Um, so if you're going out recreational fishing, and you're fishing in state waters, uh, estuaries out to three miles, you're allowed one fish, 28 to 38 inches, and it's open year-round. Uh, if you are fishing with live uh, bait, you need to actually use a circle hook. Um, circle hooks are designed to more often uh, thought to catch the fish in the lip, reduce how frequently it might swallow the bait in the hook, and therefore possibly increase the mortality rate after you catch and release them. If you're in the Delaware River and the tributaries, uh, there's some different management measures that you have to be in tune with. Um, but again, that's all included in the, in the table from attention anglers. So uh, very common species, just like the summer flounder showed, uh, the striped bass fishery is quite diverse in terms of the anglers. Um, not as many like to catch striped bass for harvest. There's a lot of conservation-minded anglers who uh, practice catch and release, but also an important segment that also likes to harvest their one fish per day for consumption. Uh, and things like circle hooks and others to help survive, increase the survival of fish that are released are, are important and major part of the rebuilding plan for striped bass. I'll now just spend a couple minutes on hard clams. It's not all fin fish. Um, uh, we also have several opportunities for harvesting your own shellfish, as you might be interested. Uh, hard clams or mercenaria, mercenaria. This is a um, 1984 report showing the landings of hard clams throughout all of New Jersey 
and just Barnegat Bay. It's a very important fishery in the 50s and earlier. Barnegat Bay and other coastal estuaries still is for some folks in Barnegat Bay, particularly up in Raritan Bay today. There's a lot of hard clams, but due to overexploitation, shifts in the ecosystem and habitat and disease, the landings and the population has gone down considerably. Nonetheless, there's a, a, an, actually an increasingly popular recreational fishery for hard clams the last several years from Barnegat Bay down into Cape May County. I think a lot of it also had to do to COVID, uh, staying local. A lot of people started recreational fishing during the pandemic and some social media web pages and um, COVID people staying local. A lot of folks have been going clamming the last several years. Um, so clams have their preferred depth, benthic habitat, salinity, temperature. Um, the state does uh, dredge surveys every 10 years or so of a given location. Um, this is northern Barnegat Bay from Manilokan to Tom's River. It's lower salinity up here. It's not really great habitat for hard clams. If you're in Ocean County, kind of want to go from, uh, you know, Forkett River. Here's Barnegat Inlet. These areas, particularly the red and green, are where they call it moderate or high during their survey. These are locations that are, have more consistent hard clams, help you hone in on where to go. Uh, the Sedge Island Marine Conservation Zone is a great spot to go recreational clamming. Um, but near Barnegat Inlet, where you have the higher salinity coming in from the ocean, uh, saltier water, um, the closer you are, it's basically Surf City to Forkett Rivers, uh, some of the good uh, hard clam uh, fishing opportunity. Unfortunately, there was a downward trend even from the 80s to 2012, a 23% decrease in the hard clams uh, in Barnegat Bay. If you go back further, it might be as high as 70% decline uh, or more in the last you know, several decades. Um, the state I'm involved is working to develop a fisheries management plan to help uh, manage what's currently available and to rebuild the population of hard clams. But uh, great opportunity, recreational fishing. As I mentioned uh, earlier, I'll, I'll show again, you do need a, a shellfish permit. And shellfish are filter feeders. They feed on the naturally occurring phytoplankton or algae in the water for their food uh, and they're sedentary. A hard clam just really moves up and down in the sand, doesn't move side to side. And an oyster, once it affixes to something, is, is permanently stationary for life. Uh, so they're also, through filter feeding, they're vulnerable to taking in uh, contaminants that might be in the water. The Bureau of Marine Water Monitoring and others, they have shellfish growing water classifications. Here's an example of Tom's River. Um, so areas in blue, are approved, you can harvest year round. Conditionally approved purple and yellow areas are locations where you can harvest during the colder months. Uh, if there are any bacteria or other pathogens in the water, they don't proliferate as much uh, beyond safe consumption rates during the colder months, uh, but will do so potentially during the warmer months of the summer. So if you're going to recreational clamming, you also wanna take a look at where you're going and make sure it's open based upon water quality. And then, you know, this right now you're allowed 150 clams uh, Monday through Saturday, one and a half inches or greater, and you do need a shellfish license. It's a very modest fee, uh, including if you are a resident senior, it's $2 and it's good for life. Uh, the most common way is, you know, hand or feet apparatuses to catch hard clams, rakes. Some people just swim and grab them with your hand, or you can shred them and feel them with your feet, or use some other type of... Uh, uh, poking device to find them in the sediment. They're usually like in the summer, the warmer months, they're, you know, maybe just, you know, an inch to three inches down, uh, relatively easy to harvest and feel. Uh, and they get a bit deeper during the warmer when they uh, go into a more dormant stage. But uh, a great opportunity also to harvest your own seafood. Uh, and then, as I noted, increasingly popular actually in the last several years. If you're going out in Barnegat Bay, you can also take a look at a lot of these different data sources including where there are launch boat ramps, tackle shops. DEP has the Barnegat Bay boater web application. I recommend checking that out if you fish anywhere in Ocean County um, to, to earmark this page. And I believe it is mobile phone app, uh, mobile phone friendly as well. I didn't include much about crabbing here today, but actually in terms of number of people, uh, we don't have good data on crabs. They don't migrate out of state waters. They don't migrate between states. So it's it's all managed by New Jersey, not by other councils and commissions that are involved in our other fisheries. And although it's very valuable commercially, top five um, and recreationally, it's, um, 
from some reports that have been done by DEP, it's most common and popular probably in terms of the numbers, uh, but not a good handle uh, on it. Uh, how many people are recreational blue crab fishing from um, marinas, piers, or on boats, but DEP has a, a dedicated webpage just on crabbing in New Jersey. If folks are interested uh, in learning more, you can check that out as a good starting point. Uh, so there are federal uh, and state partnered programs to collect data on recreational fishing, what you catch and what you bring home. Uh, if you, I would encourage you, if you were ever to be intercepted or contacted um, in person or by uh, paper mail, do honestly report what you're catching, even if it's a little bit or a lot, even if you were participated and registered in the registry and didn't fish at all, uh, or if you fish a lot and caught lots of fish. Uh, the more reliable, accurate data results in more uh, accurate and better responsive fisheries management. Whether they're, you're catching very few or a lot, people uh, might be hesitant to share their data, whether or not they're caught few or a lot or in between. Um, but there are a lot of instances, even if you were catching a little or a lot, that it ends up improving the management in the fishery. In addition to if you were to be intercepted by a federal program, you can voluntarily go to the DEP's Voluntary Angler Survey. Anytime you go fishing off the beach, uh, off a pier, off a private boat, you can go in there and include your information about how you fished, where you fished, what you threw back, what you brought home. Um, better data results in better science and better information for management. So uh, encourage you to follow these resources uh, if you do go fishing. Uh, it takes just you know a minute to five minutes to write up what you what you caught. If you like the flavor of what you're learning about today, um, one of the other programs we have here through Extension is iFish Introductory Fishery Science for Stakeholders. Uh, so this class is a 10 week class. It meets every winter, end of January or February. It'll be starting. If you're interested, you can shoot me an email on that. You can check out the web page. You can grab my email from the next slide. Uh, no tests, uh, no homework, but uh, a deep dive into the science and management behind our commercial and recreational fisheries here in New Jersey. If you had just enjoyed the primer today for the Homesteading Academy. So here again is my email. Happy to take any questions while we have where we're together today or as a follow up. Thank you, Doug. Excellent presentation. I will wait a minute to see if anyone has any questions to post in the chat. Um, Doug, let me throw this out to you real quick. We're talking about the changes of the fishery, you know, how it's affecting the recreational. Yes. Any thoughts on the, our commercial fisheries, like the sustainability of them with all the changes that are taking place? Yeah, it, it depends. A, a good example, you know, surf clams. You not you used to not have to fish beyond sight of of the beach to catch surf clams, but their their distribution has changed considerably. Deeper waters, the state water fisheries really, I don't really know if it's active anymore. Some guys out of Belford, Monmouth County still go, but those boats have had to travel further, burn more fuel, more time dredging to catch their catch their their catch their catch. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure, including processing, is important in that fishery. Some of it's already moved north. They've moved their dock locations. They moved their factories from like the Delmarva up to New Jersey or up to Massachusetts in anticipation uh, of them moving. Uh, so uh, some conversations, you know, maybe like the somebody who just kind of fished the tried and true way, they might not fare as well. But those that are more aggressive, uh, keeping in tune with different ways to fish, different species to catch, uh, it's really hard on the commercial side to get permits if you don't have the history. Uh, but those that are, have been more aggressive and adaptive have have and maybe arguably will prove more adaptive getting ready to catch different things in different ways. And just a plug, anybody I know who's been through your iFish really enjoyed it. So it's a really good program if anybody's on here is interested in it. Thank you, Bill. 